Hello and welcome to part two of this playthrough of L, a mathematical adventure, a old text adventure game uh, to teach mathematics. Uh, the program was designed for the BBC Micro, uh, an old 8-bit microcomputer uh, made in the UK, uh, used in the UK mainly in schools. Uh, at the end of the, uh, part one of the walkthrough, we arrived at the old music room. Um, uh, there were holes in the skirting board of this room. Uh, there's a piano, and there's scampering, and there's movement, and I wonder what this description is trying to tell us. There's only one way to find out. Fi no, um, the, the way to find out what's going on in this rather suggestive room is to try playing the piano, obviously, the, um, elephant in the room, and, um, you're greeted with OK when you try to play piano, which isn't exactly a very helpful <laughs> prompt. Now, I don't know if the manual for the game, I suspect the manual for the game had instructions for the teacher to actually help pupils along and probably had a full solution. Because OK is simply not enough to clue you in to how to play the piano. Until, of course, you start typing. And you have a simple scale there. Um, so if you type the keys QWERTY UI, you get notes instead of well, as well as the keys coming up, as well as the letters coming up on the screen. The rest of the keys act as normal, and it doesn't understand anything that you play, any tune that you play. Um, I was, in fact, hoping that it would understand this tune. And that it would then launch into. Is this the real life? Is this just fantasy? But it doesn't do that. And in fact, um, it simply refuses to understand what's going on. And apparently, the syntax you have to use to get it to understand is quite specific. Um, the room description clues you in on what you're supposed to be playing and it's this. Of course that's not enough because you need to actually say play. And there's a little beep there because you typed an A character. You type the letter A. And there we have a rendition, a beautiful rendition of three blind mice using every ounce of power in the bead sound chip. And a few envelope commands went into making that sound, I believe. And uh, suddenly the room is full of mice squealing and running in all directions. Several mice are running up and down the piano keyboard, while others appear to be dragging something into the room. The noise is deafening. Really? Then they disappear as quickly as they came. All is quiet again. On the ground is a small medicine bottle containing a blue liquid. On the label is printed times 1.25. On the ground is a file of pink liquid. Attached to it by string is a card which reads times 0.6. Get these intriguing objects. Get the bottle. We have to separately get each object that we want to pick up. Get the file. Um, and we could, in fact, drink the liquids inside these bottles now and affect our 
selves in some way, but I don't know what would happen if I try that, so I'm not going to try it because, in fact, um, it's not the time. Um, we have to be somewhere else in this very strange castle full of empty swimming pools and pianos and um, quite an eclectic mishmash of period detail. Nevertheless, that's the game, and we have to play by its rules. We don't make the rules. The Association of Teachers of Mathematics make the rules. Um, right. So we've played the tune. We've got these objects as yet mysterious. Let us continue with the game. We're going to go east. You're in a solarium. The room is flooded with sunlight and the heat is only just bearable. There are doors to the east and west. On the north side, a French window leads out onto a balcony. Yet another interestingly described but empty and ultimately pointless room in this game. I'm not exactly sure why there are so many pointless rooms in the game, except maybe to make the geography all link up um, in a sensible way. Although I'm still not convinced, and I think perhaps the map could have been smaller, and we might have been able to get around uh, more quickly and easily, but still, there it is. Again, I don't make the rules. Um, east into the solarium. Nothing happens here. Nothing at all. East again, and you are in a room with doors to the southwest and east. An oval-shaped snooker table stands in the centre of the room. A post is fixed to the centre of the table. On one side of this post is the only pocket, and on the other side is a spot for the ball. A cue is attached to the table by a long chain. A yellow ball is resting on the spot. If you can picture this, the key detail here is in fact that the, sh the table, the snooker table, is oval shaped. And there's a post in the centre, and at opposite sides of the post, there is respectively a hole and a ball. Which means, of course, that you can't pop the ball directly into the hole at an angle of zero degrees or 360 degrees because the post is in the way. So you in fact, can use any other angle at all to pop this ball, as I've discovered, including the angle cue ball. Ah, that doesn't in fact work. That is not understood. Yes, because it's gibberish. I apologise once again for the incompetence. Hit ball. Yes, including the angle of one degree. The ball speeds towards the cushion, bounces normally, and ends up in the pocket. Now, if you've hit the ball at an angle of one degree, has that just slipped into the pocket because the angle is insignificant? And, and, in, and in which case, how thin is this post in the middle of the table? Or have you, in fact, hit the ball with near-infinite force and it's bounced all the way around the oval table until eventually it ends up in the pocket? I don't know. Only the Association of Teachers of Mathematics knows. Anyway, the ball has, in fact, been potted. This appears to make no difference to the outcome of the game. If anyone knows any different, please enlighten me, because um, you don't need to do this to win the game. Uh, which is slightly annoying, but I guess because it's a teaching tool, um, it wasn't uh, deemed necessary to explain everything, which is somewhat odd. So we've solved that puzzle, um, which is slightly more mathsy than trying to play three blind mice on a computer keyboard. Anyway, let us now go south and proceed. You're in an anteroom, having doors to the west and north. Over the west door is an old wooden board displaying a faded warning. It says, Be warned that all who enter here will see nothing but codes. Right. Let's enter. Oh, look! Nothing but codes. This is, in fact... Possibly the most annoying puzzle ever devised by man. Um, it's a code. It's a substi substitution code. 
It's a substitution. Cipher? Or is it a code? What's a code and what's a cipher? No, it's a code. Yes, I think it is a code. It's a substitution code and, you know, it, it, uh, mathematically trivial, but um, somewhat annoying. And if you do figure out what it says, you'll learn a trick that will make life a bit easier. Although, again, an ultimately pointless trick here, in that the puzzle isn't essential for the ultimate winning of the game. But um, I'm sure we had fun solving it at the time. And uh, now that I'm coming to play this game again, it does occur to me that I can't actually remember um, solving all these puzzles. Obviously, it's a long time ago. Um, but I don't remember the details of the game, although I do remember enjoying playing the game. There are one or two puzzles which we'll come to which I do remember quite vividly, probably because I hated them. But um, this had escaped my memory, although now I see it again, uh, it's all filtering back. This puzzle can be solved by typing the alphabet out in order, which is what I'm doing now. M N O P Q R S T U V W X Y Z. Uh, I may have made a mistake there, but is it, you get the point. Um, I just pressed enter, and obviously it's come up with an error message. Um, and if you do that and work out what the coded message says, you find that there are some frail-looking spectacles here. Why are they frail-looking? I have no idea. Perhaps to make use of the fact that frail-looking is spelt with a hyphen and to confuse you a bit more with the code. Anyway, you can type get spectacles. I assure you that is what I'm typing. And suddenly, everything's back to normal. Of course, you don't know that. You forget that you can't type L for look. You type look. You're in the code room. It's a stark white room whose plaster walls are covered in scribblings. Doors lead east and west. And really, that's all that you have to do there. That's all you were there for. You can read the scribblings. Uh, they make no sense. Um, and in fact, you don't need the spectacles uh, anymore, and I'm going to drop them, because you can't carry too many things uh, at a later point in this game. Uh, once you know that you can only go east and west in this room, um, that is all you need to know, and you can get rid of the spectacles. Anyway, I went west there, plus. You are in an oriental room. Shades of the original adventure by Crowther and Woods, perhaps? Perhaps. Paintings of bamboo and red dragons cover the walls. The only door leads to the east. Here is a dodecahedron made from an enormous diamond. Very nice. What are all these strangely precisely geometrical objects doing in this mishmash of a castle? Who is Runia? Why am I after her? Why does the abbot want her? What does he want with her? Do we trust him? Do we trust anyone? Um... None of these questions will be answered in the course of playing this game. Get the dodecahedron, I abbreviate for the sake of my fingers, and um, let's see what we have so far. We have a platinum tetrahedron, a gold cube, a diamond dodecahedron, uh, two files of uh, probably magical liquid, and at this point, uh, logically, one would leave sell these objects and retire on the profits of, uh, and live a comfortable life for the rest of your days. But, of course, this is a essentially meaningless uh, mathematical game. Um, I, sorry, I do sound rather down on the game, but um, the incoherence of it is increasingly getting to me, I think. Anyway, at this point I shall pause once more and... I'll see you again in part three of the walkthrough.